Welcome to the Giving Voice to Depression podcast, produced in partnership with Mental Health America of Wisconsin. We are your co-hosts, Bridget and Terry. Each week through intimate, candid conversations with guests, we explore different perspectives on and experiences of depression. We keep it real because the illness is real. We keep it hopeful because there truly is hope in spite of what depression tells you. We are not experts or therapists. We're sisters and best friends who live with depression and have interviewed hundreds of others who do as well. By sharing stories of lived experiences, we expose depression for the lying bully it is. Hello, Bridget. Hi, Terry. This week, we received an anonymous email sent through our Facebook page. It reads... I'm curious about if Giving Voice to Depression has an episode or any resources on, and I quote, it's textbook clear that this person struggles with depression. I think meds would really help this person, but they are stubborn as hell and are proud of the fact that they don't need a doctor or medical help. Basically, how can we destigmatize antidepressants and have a helpful, uncondescending conversation with a loved one about the benefits of meds? We want to thank whoever wrote that for asking a really good, important question, for starting a much-needed conversation, and for being both caring and resourceful on behalf of someone you obviously care about. This season, we have been planning to devote an entire episode to different kinds of medications that are out there to help treat depression, why so many people have physical or mental resistance to them, the unfortunate fact that they don't work for everyone and any other questions we think of or you suggest. A reminder that on our website, givingvoicetodepression.com, you can now record us a message anonymously if you wish. You can leave a question for us to explore, ideas for episodes or feedback on this podcast or our social media community or daily posts. All will help make this a more helpful resource for listeners. They really will. Please reach out to us. We'd uh, super appreciate it. Mm-hmm. We had already recorded our conversation with this week's guest, Michael Landsberg, founder of the Sick Not Weak nonprofit. But we certainly kept the listener's situation in mind as we put this episode together. And we think this episode directly addresses the second part of the question How can we destigmatize meds? One answer is by talking about it, by saying with the same charge somebody would share notice I didn't use the word admit, that they take statins to lower their cholesterol or any other prescription to control and manage any other health condition. I use the phrase, they put a floor beneath my feet again. To be clear, we are not promoting meds in this episode, though, full disclosure, we do both take them. If something else works for you, that's great. We just hope that no one rules out a possible source of relief based solely on stigma. Here now is Michael Landsberg giving his voice to depression. Uh, I had anxiety as a kid, massive anxiety as a kid. Anxiety drove my life. It prevented me from doing the things that I wanted to do. Uh, I had these irrational fears that I would never, ever have told anybody else. And I just carried them around. And I came from this amazing, loving household where my parents would have done anything for me. And yet I just I just never felt like I was ever even close to being able to share with anyone what I was experiencing. And why did you not think anybody would understand? Did you think they'd get mad at you? Did you think they wouldn't believe you? Well, I'm not sure I believe myself. See, he, this is going to sound weird, but I've never lived in anyone else's brain. <laughs> I mean, you never do, obviously. But when you're a kid, especially, you know, you're not 100 percent sure what's normal. You're not 100 percent sure, you know, is this my fault? Uh, am I to blame for this? Am I making this up? Is this irrational? Is this irrational? So, like, I didn't know what it was. I was pretty sure it wasn't normal because I saw kids doing the things that I was afraid to do without experiencing it. But I think that that all of us have this insecurity when it comes to mental illness, or many of us do, um, that it's not real, that somehow it's self-inflicted, that somehow we have brought this upon ourselves because of weakness. At 40, when depression struck, however, Michael's thinking was very different. He realized then he was sick not weak, a distinction he's made a popular social media hashtag and community for discussions about mental health. 
when I then started to suffer from severe depression, I never blamed myself. I never thought, oh my gosh, you know, how did I let this happen to me? I knew that this was out of my control. I knew that this had been done to me as opposed to me doing it to it. Research consistently finds that many people do not seek treatment in the early stages of mental illnesses, in part because they don't recognize the symptoms. For mood disorders that include depression, you hear that anywhere from 6 to 10 years commonly pass between first experiencing symptoms and getting help. Fortunately for Michael, he didn't wait that long. For six months, Terry, I I lived uh, either in denial, or I think even more of a factor was not knowing how sick I was because depression for me was a tiny minuscule change in how I felt, how I saw myself. It was not like all of a sudden it's like, whoa, am I ever depressed? It was this tiny tap on my arm that I couldn't feel, but when it accumulated enough, it was like, wow. You know, one day I was asked to do something and I and I said no, and then I realized, wow, that's not something I would ever have rejected, ever. Mm-hmm. So why did I do that? And I started, to, uh, I started to assess my life and try to figure out back over the last six months, what are the things that I have not been doing? Uh, and I realized that I had changed. And this was the, the real realization, which I, I I still find to be devastating was that, you know, I had lost who I was. It was like I was replaced by somebody else and I did not like that person. I did not want to be that person. So that six months was a waste of my life that I'll never get back. And uh, I try to help people who've wasted the six months, who've wasted five years, who've wasted 10 years to understand that you, you don't always know that you have this terrible illness because it happens so slowly and because we often deny ourselves the diagnosis, which is, hey, I'm sick because we like to, and this is a weird human characteristic, beat ourselves up. So it's like, oh, this is my fault. And oh my gosh, I can't believe I let this happen to me. Far from embarrassing, shameful, or even difficult, Michael refers to the day he first saw a doctor after that year and a half as one of the best days of his journey. I, I talked my way in to see a psychiatrist. I got in there and I said, look, here, here's, here's what, here's what we're dealing with. I know that I have depression. I know it, right? I mean, I've read everything I could find about it. I've got every symptom imaginable. My life is basically over at this point until I find a way to deal with my depression. But I need you to confirm that for me and I need you to treat me. So that was my first appointment to uh, to a psychiatrist. And she said, you know, she didn't argue. Like two minutes later, she went, you know, yeah, you know, you obviously have severe depression. And that was kind of my first step back towards the light. That bears repeating. Going to a doctor who named his illness and began to treat it was his first step back toward the light. And the sooner we take that step, the sooner we notice the signs of depression, the sooner we can start to see or just believe in the possibility of light and joy in our lives again. So the slowness of it, the tap on the shoulders, you describe it, and I've uh, used the, the, the cooking the frog in the boiling water, right? If you put it in the boiling water, it jumps out. If you put it in the pot and slowly bring it up, you've got frog soup. Yeah, I think that's probably a Wisconsin thing. We don't serve a lot of boiled frog up here, but... You know. <laughs> well, you've heard this. You've heard the expression. Yes. You know, I have another expression, uh, and the expression is, or the uh, the metaphor is for taking a bath. You know, you get in the bath, and the bath, you make it hot, and it feels great. And then after, I don't know, eight minutes, you realize it's not great anymore. You realize it's actually not warm at all, but you didn't notice it changing. So because they're, you know, the tiny changes in temperature are not noticeable. It's when they accumulate enough change that you go, okay, now I know this bath is not hot or warm anymore. Similarly with me, it was the, you know, removal of parts of who I was bit by bit by bit. And then eventually it was like, whoa, wait a second. You know, where am I? Who am I? Why am I? So if that's The reality, our reality, certainly our shared reality, and I don't know that it's that way for everybody, but doesn't it seem like if we could notice those degrees, those taps happening and do something early that we could maybe avoid sitting in the cold tub? 
Uh, you know, I think I think without a doubt that is what you want. The problem is you can't notice what you can't notice. Which is where friends, family, coworkers, and others come in, right? We don't have to be experts in depression or its symptoms to notice when someone just isn't themselves. That's our opportunity to suit up and show up, to start an honest conversation that could literally save them years of hurt and possible despair. And support can be asking in a situation like Michael described, hey, how come you just said no to that when it's something we both know you usually enjoy? One of the markers for depression is the loss of the ability to experience joy. It's like you can't, something's missing. No matter what good things may happen to you, you can realize, well, that's a good thing. I just got $10 million, but you can't feel the goodness. And I can't tell you how many times I've said those kinds of things and people have come up afterwards and went, oh my gosh, you're talking about me. You know, I realized when you described what it felt like to you, when you described the fact that you ceased to be you, I realized that, you know, I've been living as an in an alternate universe as an alternate person for a year or two years. So I think alerting people to the idea that this doesn't present itself like, you know, no one would get stabbed in the stomach and go, I wonder what just happened. I think you're pretty sure, but this is the opposite of that. The clinical term for that is anhedonia, defined as the lack of pleasure or the inability to experience it, even from things we once enjoyed. I spent two years, two years, and I'd had it before, and yet I didn't recognize it this time. You know, it wasn't um, like, oh, shoot, it's back, I better go to the doctor. You know, I just bought hook, line, and sinker the crap it told me. Well, I, I think that, again, your experience is my experience, and your experience is also almost everyone's experience. The irony of this is that there's there's so much we all have in common, people who suffer from depression, and yet we all feel like we're the only ones at one point. We all have this sense of nobody could possibly understand. Nobody else is going through this. You know, I'm on this island all by myself. Feeling all alone on an island in the darkness. When in fact, every year in the United States alone, more than 42 million other adults are experiencing some mental illness too. That's nearly one in five. One in five adults who are a potential source of comfort, connection, and information. But when no one talks about mental health disorders, many of us go it alone, which is sad and harder and potentially dangerous. So here we are, two people that publicly speak about our our depression, our mental illness, our treatments, our ups and our downs. It, it's it's amazing how much we have in common, and it's amazing how valuable that message is. Uh, I mean, your message is valuable to me, right? You know, I'm you know all the things that I've gone through. It's like, hey, somebody else has as well. Not that I didn't know that someone else had, mm-hmm. but you know, to someone who's watching right now, who's going. I don't know. This is sounding really familiar to me. There is there is untold power in sharing. Uh, and I don't mean that in a like a spiritual way. I mean the power that people feel, the empowerment that they feel yes. when they hear people like you and I talking about depression without shame and embarrassment and without sounding weak empowers them to do so. Gosh, I relate to so much of that. I think that's the point, right? Whenever one of us speaks up, then others can say like, oh, wow, that's, I didn't know it was so similar to my experience. Right. Empowering and untold power in sharing, as Michael's just said, mm-hmm. you know, it's, um, you know, I personally have found through this podcast that saying my experience, sharing my experience, putting words even maybe for the first time to my experience, you know, has emboldened me to become I don't want to say friends with it, but, um, no, you know, no, no. Uh, what would you say? What's the word, Terry? Like, um, you know, familiar with it. It's like, it's like a neighbor. It's a neighbor I don't like that lives on the other side of my fence. Mm-hmm. You know? <laughs> and sometimes they peek their head over or speak over the fence to me. And that just allows me to relate differently to it mm-hmm. instead of it being all consuming and stripping of, of, of me to myself. And your metaphor is uh, significant, I think, because you are indicating that there's a fence between you and it as opposed right to having it, it right now. Yeah, right. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Cause when it moves in and becomes part of what seems like your cells, that's a little harder to exactly. 
Yeah. Absolutely. No, that storms come in and blow that fence right down sometimes. Yeah, they do. We'll continue our conversation with Michael Landsberg next week, focusing on his experience of both taking and going off antidepressants, as well as some of the things that he's learned about how to best offer support to someone who's suffering. And I'd like to add that, remember that sometimes when we go on meds, um, the more common than you think experience of having suicidal thoughts can occur. And that was certainly my experience. And um, I didn't put it together because my brain was already saying such garbled, nasty stuff to me that that just seemed like one more. I didn't put it together that it was the meds. So I just naively stayed on them. And I have to say it's worked for years ever since. So although we're not endorsing meds, it works for me, but it was a bumpy start. Going on and off can be dangerous times, which is why we're supposed to do it under, you know, a a professional's care and let some of the people around us know. So we hope that the listener who asked about meds is tuning in, heard this, and will again listen next week. And if you have a comment or question for us, again, we want to remind you, you can now go to givingvoicetodepression.com, look in the upper left-hand corner for the red record button, and leave us a message, whether that's using your name and email address or anonymously, whatever you're comfortable with. Hey guys, I got to go eat my boiled frog soup. See you next week. (laughs) I'm going to take a cold bath. (laughs) We truly hope that our podcast brings a little more understanding, helps you better articulate your experience of depression or better understand how to support someone else's. We invite you to join us for daily posts on the Giving Voice to Depression Facebook page and on Twitter and Instagram at Voice Depression. It is a comfort to be among fellow travelers on depression's dark road. And remember, if you're struggling, speak up. If someone else is, listen up.